Scomping Droids, An Actor's Redemption, Darth Vader Cosplay, and more. It's not a trap, just all the Easter eggs you missed in The Mandalorian Season 3. Warning, spoilers ahead. In the time since The Book of Boba Fett, Din Djarin seems to have become much more comfortable flying his new starfighter. The rebuilt N1, famous for being the baseline ship of the Naboo Royal Fleet, is loaded with nifty gadgets and add-ons. But it also comes packed with plenty of winks and nods to its debut appearance in The Phantom Menace. When Din swoops in to save the Mandalorians from the giant monster in Season 3, Episode 1, he kills the beast with proton torpedoes. These iconic weapons go all the way back to the original Death Star run, of course. But they're also used by Anakin to destroy the Trade Federation's droid control ship in The Phantom Menace. Brief shots of the ship's interior reveal the same sleek controls and readouts seen in the prior film. And of course, when Din is attacked by pirates later in the same episode, he evades them by spinning. Hey, that's a good trick. <laughs> One of the more ethereal moments in the first episode of Season 3 comes during a hyperspace voyage. From his bubble cockpit in the new N1, Grogu has a 360-degree view of hyperspace. As they travel to Navarro, Grogu notices some looming, shadowy shapes just out of focus beyond the ship. If you've seen Star Wars Rebels, you'll recognize these strange figures instantly. Known as the Pergil, these giant space whales can travel through hyperspace naturally, Legends shared by Hera Syndulla in Rebels suggest that other species first developed hyperspace travel to emulate the Pergil's abilities. We also know from Rebels that the creatures can be connected via the Force. Perhaps that's why Grogu is able to sense them so profoundly. While the Pergil aren't directly discussed in the Apostate, their appearance seems like a clear setup for later in the season, or for the upcoming Ahsoka series. During her cameo appearance in The Mandalorian Season 2, Ahsoka reveals that she's hunting Grand Admiral Thrawn, who was last seen whisked away by a Pergil in the Rebels finale. And since Ezra's already been confirmed to appear in the upcoming series, it's safe to assume that the Pergil will return. Under the rule of High Magistrate Grief Karga, the once backwater planet of Navarro has transformed into a thriving trade hub. The automated message that plays as Din lands even calls it the Gym of the Outer Rim. Grief says that it's becoming a major stop along the heavily traveled Hydean Way. That might explain why there are so many different sorts of aliens and droids on the planet now, many of which should look familiar to Star Wars fans. There are Mon Calamari, Quarren, and even a cook droid of the same basic style seen in Attack of the Clones. There are also a few familiar faces from Jabba the Hutt's Tatooine Palace, an EV series supervisor droid, and a whole tree filled with Kowakian monkeys. Of course, the esteemed salacious B. Crumb himself, Jabba's Kowakian pet, is nowhere to be found since he died along with Jabba in Return of the Jedi. One face you might expect to see on Navarro is mentioned only in name, however, Cara Dune, the former Rebel Shock trooper played by Gina Carano. Carano was famously fired from The Mandalorian after a series of tweets comparing being a Republican to the Holocaust criticizing safe masking policies during the COVID-19 pandemic and mocking the LGBTQ community. When Grief tells Din he needs a marshal, the Mandalorian asks what happened to Kara. What about Marshal Dune? After she brought in Moff Gideon, she was recruited by special forces. How can you tell that Dave Filoni had his hands on a Star Wars project? Looking for weak way pirates is a good start. A group of the infamous racketeers shows up on Navarro in the Apostate and immediately starts causing trouble. To be fair, not every pirate in the gang is weak way. The spiky-headed race most famous for giving us the inexplicable Hondo Onaka in Clone Wars and Rebels. Other races are represented as well, including what appears to be a new live-action Trandoshan design. Din Djarin and Grief Karga do away with the crooks easily enough, but that's not the end of them. The encounter runs Din afoul of Gorian Shard, a self-proclaimed pirate king who later battles the Mandalorian in space. Shard himself is not Weequay and seems like a sad substitute for good old Hondo, but he does bear a strange resemblance to Davy Jones of Pirates of the Caribbean fame. To complete his mission of redemption and journey back to Mandalore, 
Din decides that he needs a droid. Unfortunately, Din's traumatic childhood during the Clone Wars has left him with some major droid trust issues. The only one he wants to work with is IG-11, who inconveniently is dead. In trying to repair the droid, Din accidentally triggers IG-11's old programming, prompting him to lash out and attack Grogu. Of course, the droid doesn't have any legs, so he has to crawl slowly across the floor. This seems like a direct reference to the end of the Terminator, in which the titular mechanoid assassin continues its pursuit after having its legs blown off. IG-11 even states his intent to terminate the asset. Surely, that's not a coincidental choice of words. When it becomes clear to Din that he can't fix IG-11 on his own, he takes him to the experts, Anzell and Droidsmiths. That's right, the same species and profession as the Rise of Skywalker breakout star, Babu Frick. While Babu himself doesn't appear to be present, the Anzellan we do meet have the same charm and no-nonsense attitude. Babu has become quite the fan favorite since his debut in the 2019 film, so it's fun to see the Anzellans return, and also to learn that the whole race is thought of as the best droidsmiths in the galaxy. Is this a cultural tradition, or? Are the Anzellans just naturally gifted at working with sentient machines? These great mysteries of Babu Frick's people remain. But with luck, we'll learn more about this mysterious alien race. At the end of Season 3, Episode 1, Din and Grogu travel to Kalivala to meet with Bo-Katan Kryze. He asks to join her mission to retake Mandalore, but she responds that the faction she built abandoned her after she failed to win the Darksaber. Since Din is the one who now holds the weapon, she clearly resents him, but she seems to resent her people's superstitious ways even more. She even says, wave that thing around and they'll do whatever you say. It's hard not to take this line as a reference to Mandalore's tragic history. Bo-Katan's sister, Duchess Satine Kryze, was killed by the Darksaber when it was wielded by Darth Maul during the Clone Wars. A faction of Mandalorians followed Maul afterwards simply because he had won the blade in combat, allowing him to rule the planet from the shadows. Bo-Katan helped Ahsoka Tano and her Republic forces oust the villain in the Clone Wars Season 7. But that didn't end her or the planet's troubles. Bo-Katan even partly blames Din's old clan for Mandalore's decline. If you've watched the Clone Wars and Rebels, you know Bo-Katan's pain. She watched her planet be torn apart by radicals, terrorists, separatists, clones, and Imperial occupiers before finally seeing it burned to nothing. Sitting on the throne her sister must have sat on decades prior, Bo-Katan looks like she's finally fed up with it all. You might think Tatooine's barren landscape wouldn't generate much festive energy, but that's far from the truth. In addition to general cantina hanging and the thrill of frequent shootouts, the desert planet has at least one major holiday, Bunta Eve. When Din Djarin visits mechanic Pelimoto in Chapter 18, the holiday is nigh and viewers see her complaining to a client, as part of a scam of course, about having to work on Bunta Eve. This isn't the first time the holiday is mentioned in Star Wars canon. The pod racing event won by Anakin in The Phantom Menace is called the Bunta Eve Classic, so it has long been known as a big day for denizens of Tatooine. According to some Star Wars encyclopedias and sourcebooks, the holiday celebrates a hut named Bunta, who supposedly achieved godhood. According to Peli, it's mostly an excuse for drinking and carousing in the cantinas. When Din Djarin and Grogu reunite with Pelimoto in the Mines of Mandalore, Grogu is so happy he literally jumps for joy. The force flip he does is a nice little nod to Yoda's own dexterous fighting style, and Peli responds with a deep cut reference. Who taught you how to leap like a Lerman, huh? The Lerman are small, lemur-like creatures native to the planet Megito. They debuted in a season one episode of Star Wars The Clone Wars. The episode Jedi Crash sees three Jedi, Anakin Skywalker, Ahsoka Tano, and Ayla Sakura crash on the planet Maradun. Anakin is severely injured, so Ahsoka and Ayla enlist help from a group of local Lermans. Led by the strict pacifist Tiwat Ka, this faction departed their home system and colonized Maradun to escape the war. While certainly not a central species in the grand Star Wars mythos, The Mandalorian Season 3 shows that they haven't been forgotten. Din Djarin gains a surprising new ally in Season 3, Astromech Droid R5-D4. 
The droid first appeared in the series in Season 2, but he takes on a much more significant role in Season 3 as Din's official companion. This is indeed the same R5-D4 who debuted in A New Hope, and The Mandalorian adds some interesting details to his canonical story. R5 is most famous for nearly becoming a primary droid in the series. However, it had a bad motivator, while Luke Skywalker and Owen Lars were in the process of buying him from the Jawas. Instead, R2-D2 went on to help save the day and become a galactic hero. What you might not know is that R5 blew his motivator on purpose to ensure R2's mission was a success. In the short story The Red One, featured in the collection From a Certain Point of View, it's revealed that R2 tried to sabotage R5 the night before the sale. R5 woke up and noticed the attack, prompting R2 to explain that the fate of the galaxy depended on him escaping the Jawas. In a selfless move, R5 agreed to sabotage himself. Pelimoto says that R5 went on to serve in the Rebellion after his encounter with R2, which has been alluded to before. After two full seasons and some bonus adventures, Din Djarin and Grogu finally journey to Mandalore in Chapter 18. There's a nice scene before they land that has Din pointing out various features of the system, including the moon where he grew up, Concordia. While the two don't go there in the episode, Star Wars The Clone Wars visits Concordia multiple times. Most notably, Concordia is the home of Death Watch during the Clone Wars. The rogue faction believed that Duchess Satine Kreese's pacifist government would destroy what defined Mandalore. So they schemed and prepared in secret, waiting for the right moment to strike. Since the Children of the Watch, the hyperzealous group to which Din belongs, spawned from Death Watch later in the Star Wars timeline, it makes perfect sense that he would have grown up there. Bo-Katan also spent a lot of time on Concordia as one of Death Watch's chief lieutenants. It's interesting to see how much she despises the group now, given that she helped lead so many of its attacks on Mandalore during the Clone Wars. Din's journey to Mandalore ultimately leads him to the ruins of Sundari, the planet's old capital city. The living waters he must bathe in to earn redemption is beneath the city in the old Beskar mines. Specifically, Bo-Katan tells him that the mines lay beneath the city's civic center. While this particular location isn't mentioned in the Clone Wars, the animated series does spend quite a bit of time in Sundari. As the seat of Duchess Satine Kreese's brief pacifist rule, the city is visited frequently by the likes of Ahsoka Tano and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Death Watch first enters the story by bombing Sundari's Peace Park, which could be close to the Civic Center. A lot of time is also spent in the Sundari Royal Palace, where Maul kills Satine and, later, duels Ahsoka. What might be difficult to discern in The Mandalorian without knowledge of the Clone Wars is that Sundari was once a fully enclosed dome city, as were most Mandalorian settlements at the time. After rescuing Mando from the perils of Mandalore's mines in the episode, Bo-Katan speaks briefly about her family history. She mentions her own brief rule of the planet, which took place in the immediate aftermath of the Clone Wars, before she was ousted by the Empire. She also discusses her father. He was a great man. He died defending Mandalore. Though Bo-Katan and her sister Satine have been key figures in Star Wars for years, very little is known about the rest of their family history. In the past, Star Wars books have identified their father as Duke Adonai Kreese, who is said to have been a strong leader, but not much else has ever been revealed. The ending of The Mandalorian Chapter 18 contains a huge revelation. As he attempts to cleanse himself in the living waters, Din Djarin plummets deep down into the depths. Bo-Katan leaps in to save him, but on their way back up, they see an impossible sight, a living mythosaur thought to have been extinct for generations. The mythosaur is known best not for its actual status as a massive, deadly creature, but for becoming the logo of the Mandalorians. The mythosaur skull sigil can be seen across the franchise, referencing the Mandalorians, including in the armorer's various workshops. The symbol first appeared in The Empire Strikes Back as a decoration on Boba Fett's armor, and for many years, it was associated more with bounty hunters in general than with Mandalorians. In the new canon, however, the symbol has been directly tied to Mandalorian culture. Bo-Katan goes into that history a bit in the episode when she reads a plaque mounted on a wall of the mine. It explains how the original Mandalore supposedly killed a mythosaur in the living waters. Ancient Mandalorians are purported to have ridden the creatures into battle. More intriguing is that the series has previously planted seeds of a prophecy concerning the Mythosaur, 
in the Book of Boba Fett, the armorer reveals a prophecy to him. The songs of eons past foretold of the Mythosaur rising up to herald a new age of Mandalore. Now, it seems only a matter of time before he rides this new one into battle, Darksaber in hand. At the beginning of Chapter 19, The Convert, Din and Bo-Katan exchange in an exciting dogfight with some TIE Interceptors, an advanced TIE model designed for ship-to-ship -ship combat. TIE Interceptors first appeared in Star Wars Return of the Jedi during the Battle of Endor. Since then, they've become a staple of Star Wars video games and other ancillary stories, probably just because they look so dang cool. After taking down the first deployment of TIE Interceptors with Din, Bo-Katan is forced to watch as three TIE Bombers destroy her family's ancestral home. First introduced in The Empire Strikes Back, TIE Bombers are the same kind of ship that bombed Mandalore to oblivion in The Great Purge, which makes this moment hit all the harder. If you've played video game series like Star Wars Battlefront or the Star Wars Rogue Squadron series, one particular line during this dogfight may stand out. Interceptors are a lot tougher than TIE Fighters. Historically, TIE Interceptors have been portrayed as the Empire's flimsiest model in video games, sacrificing armor for speed. Still, according to Din, they're superior in every way. During the space battle that opens the Convert, Bo-Katan pulls off what looks like a Koya Grand turn to surprise a pursuer, cutting her engines and spinning on a dime to line up a shot. Din does something similar during a vertical maneuver, flying straight into the sky before cutting his engines and flipping 180 degrees for a diving attack. A Koya Grand Turn is a high-skill Star Wars flying technique, first mentioned by name in Heir to the Empire, a Star Wars Legends novel released in 1991 that also introduced fans to Grand Admiral Thrawn. The second wave of fighters coming after our heroes is even larger than the first, prompting Bo to question how an Imperial warlord could have so many at his disposal. It's pretty clear that this line is setting up some even bigger future battles, possibly even the return of Thrawn. During the dogfight with the TIE Interceptors, Din drops a couple of stray lines that sound like direct references to the Rogue Squadron video games. Thanks for the backup. Two more to go. In the second game in the series, 2001's Rogue Squadron 2, Rogue Leader, most levels involve you taking out waves of enemy fighters. Your wingmates will call out when you're close to the end. Two more to go. While Din's dialogue is generic enough that it could just be coincidence, it feels like an homage. Rogue Leader is a beloved classic, and the battle on Kalevala is structured just like one of its levels, with multiple stages, ship changes, and waves of enemy fighters. Plus, it wouldn't be the first time that the modern Star Wars canon has referenced older video games. From Knights of the Old Republic character Darth Revan being mentioned in The Rise of Skywalker, to the clone commandos from Republic Commando popping up in The Bad Batch, the franchise loves to pay tribute to its gaming past. Most of the convert takes place on Coruscant and follows Dr. Pershing as he tries to acclimate to life in the New Republic. We first see him giving a speech about how the amnesty program for former Imperials has helped him. It's an interesting scene that takes place in a familiar building. The red carpeted theater where Pershing gives his talk is the same place where Sheev Palpatine once took Anakin Skywalker to the opera. In Revenge of the Sith, we see a similar exterior shot of the orb-like venue, officially known as the Galaxy's Opera House. Using the same venue here is a nice touch, as it demonstrates just how little has actually changed for the wealthy residents of Coruscant. Empire, Rebels, New Republic, I can't keep track. On the taxi ride home from giving his speech at the Galaxy's Opera House, Dr. Pershing gets some travel tips from his droid driver, who mentions the Sky Dome Botanical Gardens and the Holographic Museum of Extinct Animals. At the latter, the droid recommends checking out the Montebog of Malastare, which was previously mentioned in a 2003 Star Wars RPG sourcebook. The Sky Dome, meanwhile, previously appeared in Legends novels like Star Wars Jedi Search and Republic Commando True Colors. Even the specific attraction the droid names there, the Mysis Blossoms, is a reference from an old video game. The plant is native to the Wookiee homeworld of Kashyyyk and appeared there in the now-defunct MMO video game Star Wars Galaxies. The Mysis Blossoms on Coruscant can also be read as a nod to the famous cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. Both are beautiful foreign flowers brought to spruce up a capital city.
Ever wondered what days of the week are called in the Star Wars universe? If you're a real fanatic, you might already know. But now thanks to The Mandalorian, even casual fans can look forward to Tongs Day and Bindu Day like true galactic citizens. Bindu Day and Tongs Day, both mentioned in The Convert, belong to the Galactic Standard Calendar, a common system based on Coruscant's own rotations. In the Legends timeline, the calendar had a five-day week that included those two days. Of course, due to every planet having its own unique size, rotational patterns, and cultural history, the supposedly standard calendar isn't quite as ubiquitous as the denizens of Coruscant likely think. In the episode, it seems safe to deduce that it's not everyone's favorite day, given the context in which Elia Kane says, Tongs days, am I right? The old legend's calendar had Tongs Day in the middle of the week, but it's unclear if that's still the case. A galaxy-wide civil war that lasts for decades leaves a pretty heavy footprint of weapons, ships, and gear. The convert spends a lot of time exploring this idea. Dr. Pershing's new job under the New Republic's amnesty program involves cataloging Imperial gear, most of which is set to be destroyed. We later see massive shipyards filled with decommissioned Star Destroyers just sitting in the middle of Coruscant. While the Imperial gear is getting trashed, old Rebel equipment is apparently still worth using. For instance, the guards who arrest Pershing at the end of the convert wear the same bulbous helmets that the Rebel soldiers wear in A New Hope. However, even some of the Rebels' old gear is apparently headed for the scrap heap, as Pershing's supervisors inform him that the Alliance fleet is also getting decommissioned. There is perhaps no Star Wars line more heavily memed or spoofed than this one. It's a trap! The iconic declaration uttered by Admiral Akbar in Return of the Jedi is as goofy as it is beloved, and is so famous that even Star Wars itself can't seem to help but pay homage to it. In The Convert, after being arrested by New Republic soldiers, Dr. Pershing is strapped into a frightening device that he calls a mind flayer. Administering the treatment is a Mon Calamari, the same amphibious race as Akbar. So Pershing's choice of words in this moment is a nice bit of levity in a pretty bleak episode. It was a trap! Season 3, Episode 4, The Foundling, opens on a training day for Din and Grogu's covert. Foundlings and others are shown training in various forms of combat and weaponry, many of which have become synonymous with the warriors of Mandalore. Grogu himself engages in a duel with the darts used by Din and Jango Fett, among others. We also see the famous wrist-mounted flamethrowers, rockets being launched, and a whole lot of knife fighting. There's never been any doubt that Din's covert takes the way very seriously, but it's rewarding to see its members all practicing so rigorously together. In a way, this scene is the closest we've gotten in the show to the Mandalorians of the old Star Wars Legends timeline, where there was never a pacifist era or a Death Watch. There was simply a race of hardened warriors who lived by a creed and longed to fight. The Foundling makes a specific reference to Death Watch, as well as when the Armorer tells Paz Vizsla to take the Shriek Hawk training team on a mission to rescue Ragnar, a dangerous creature native to Mandalore. The Shriek Hawk was the symbol of Clan Vizsla during the Clone Wars, when Pre Vizsla ruled Death Watch. Given the nature of the creature that kidnaps Ragnar, which Bo Katan calls a raptor, the team name seems appropriate. Pitting Grogu against a human child in a combat challenge might seem cruel and ill-considered at first. And yet, the little guy makes his dad proud. Din pits Grogu against Ragnar, Paz Vizsla's son in a game of darts. After taking two direct shots to the chest, Grogu listens to Din's urgings and uses his Force powers to secure a victory. It's a triumphant moment for the little guy, and one that evokes both Yoda and Luke Skywalker. Yoda famously used his small size and agility to disorient opponents, flipping all around and attacking from different angles. However, Luke also uses the somersault move quite a bit in the original trilogy. He modeled the technique for Grogu during their brief time training together during the events of the Book of Boba Fett. Clearly, the Foundling was paying attention. After the raptor kidnaps Ragnar in the Foundling, Bo-Katan chases the creature to its nest and returns with the coordinates. She compares the area to the peaks of Kyra Morit, where she apparently trained in her youth. These are no higher than the peaks of Kyra Morit. This is a deep cut reference to the Legends timeline. Specifically, it's a callback to Karen Travis's Republic Commando novels. First introduced in Republic Commando True Colors, 
Cairo Morat was a settlement on Mandalore composed of renegades and outcasts. During and immediately after the Clone Wars, it became a bastion for clones who abandoned the army, as their Jango Fett DNA effectively made them Mandalorians. Reintroducing Kyra Morat into the canon is a fun detail for those who've read the books. But, of course, it probably still doesn't exist in the same way it used to. The geography of Mandalore itself has changed a lot in the current canon from what it was in Legends, and the lore surrounding clone deserters has also changed. After two and a half seasons of mystery, Season 3's fourth episode finally shows how Grogu escaped the Jedi Temple during Order 66. While several Jedi sacrifice themselves in order to get him to safety, it's Master Kelleran Beck who guards him most of the way. If you don't have kids who also love Star Wars, you might not know that Kelleran has been a part of the Star Wars universe for years. The character debuted in the online Star Wars children's game show, Jedi Temple Challenge, in which he acts as the host. More importantly, both the game show and Mandalorian versions of Kelleran are played by Ahmed Best the same actor who brought Jar Jar Binks to life in the prequel trilogy. It's great to see Best get to do some real lightsaber action, even if his purple blade from the show is replaced with a green one. At one point, Kelleran picks up a blue saber from one of his fallen comrades and fights with both, showing why he earned the nickname, the Sabered Hand. After an extended airborne chase, the Mandalorians manage to save Ragnar from the raptor that captures him, a beast that bears a striking resemblance to the pterosaurs seen elsewhere in Star Wars Legends. Rescuing Ragnar doesn't defeat the beast, though. For that task, the Mandalorians enlist the help of the giant alligator creature from Season 3, Episode 1. Din breaks Ragnar free and then knocks the raptor down into the water after inhibiting one of its wings. Once down, it's quickly gobbled up by the much larger amphibian. This feels like a reference to the first act of The Phantom Menace, in which Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, and Jar Jar are chased through the core of Naboo by increasingly large sea monsters that eat each other. There's always a bigger fish. At the end of The Foundling, the armorer makes a new shoulder pauldron for Bo-Katan. She asks while forging it if she should inscribe the signet of the Night Owl. During the Clone Wars, Bo led a subgroup of Death Watch called the Night Owls, identifiable by their blue armor and distinctive visors. The faction continued fighting for Mandalore's freedom after Maul took the planet, even battling alongside Ahsoka Tano for a time. Clearly, the Night Owl symbol still means a lot to Bo. Her armor is basically the same in The Mandalorian as it was in The Clone Wars. However, she chooses to inscribe the sign of the Mythosaur on her new pauldron instead. Her encounter with the beast beneath the living waters obviously affected her, so it makes sense that she would want to wear both icons. Bo-Katan mentions her father again in The Foundling, revealing that he often pushed her to challenge herself in the ways of combat. This stands in stark contrast to Bo's late sister Satine, who was a strict pacifist. That raises the question, if Bo was the one who actually aligned with their father's ideals, why did Satine take the throne? after him. Han shot first isn't quite the rallying cry among Star Wars fans that it once was, largely because there's just so much more Star Wars these days. Arguments over the changes made in George Lucas's special editions of the original trilogy have faded as angry fans simply have a lot more to complain about now, but that doesn't keep The Mandalorian from referencing the famous fan debate. In the original cut of A New Hope, Han Solo shoots Greedo dead in the Moss Eisley Cantina before he can draw his blaster. In the special edition re-release, the footage is edited so that Han's shot is in response to one of Greedo's. After all, we can't have our hero be a stone-cold killer, right? Thus began the Han shot first rebellion among fans. In episode 5 of the third season of The Mandalorian, Grief Karga and pirate king Gorian Shard call back to this bit of Star Wars history. Right after the pirate attacks Navarro, he calls Grief and accuses him of murdering one of his men. Grief responds that he shot first, which leads Shard to tell Grief that he'll be shooting first from now on. While speaking to Grief Karga via hologram at the beginning of The Pirate, Gorian Shard references what's probably the most popular card game in the Star Wars galaxy, or at least the Outer Rim. This isn't Sabacc. You can't bluff your way out of this one. At the start of the season, when Grief and Din take out some of Shard's men, it's implied that the High Magistrate and the Pirate King have a history. It seems that a good portion of the shared past was spent at the Sabacc table. Sabacc is most famously featured in Solo, A Star Wars Story, as the game through which Han Solo wins the Millennium Falcon from Lando Calrissian. 
However, that's far from its only Star Wars appearance. The poker-like game, of which many varieties exist, has popped up in everything from Star Wars Rebels and The Bad Batch to the High Republic novels. In fact, in the very first episode of The Mandalorian, you can see some patrons in Grief's old saloon playing Sabacc. The New Republic base on Adelphi has been referenced before in The Mandalorian, and it finally appears in The Pirate. Though the outpost bears all the fancy iconography of the New Republic, it still feels like a rebel base. Adelphi is a great example of just how quickly the Rebel Alliance transformed into a permanent government, a transformation that is still far from complete in The Mandalorian. One shelf on the wall of the outpost cantina has different models of rebel pilot helmets seen in the original trilogy. The bar itself has helmets of a different sort, of stormtroopers, and the remains of an old Imperial probe droid. These seem to have been hung up as trophies of sorts, which makes sense in this kind of military base. In the season finale, Captain Teva even calls them trophies. The mystery man who briefly speaks with Captain Teva on the Adelphi base is none other than Zeb Aurelios, one of the lead protagonists of Star Wars Rebels and a central piece of the Ghost crew. Through four seasons of the animated series, Zeb fought the Empire on every front. Now, it seems he's been stationed on Adelphi and is still played by voice actor Steve Bloom. Zeb's species, the Lasat, were actually inspired by some of Ralph McQuarrie's original concept art for Chewbacca. This is just one of the many instances where Rebels took design cues from McQuarrie's unused work. If you missed out on the animated series but played the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order video game, you may recognize Zeb as being of the same species as Jaro T'Pol, Cal Kestis' original Jedi Master. The pilot's bar also sees the return of three named characters played by behind-the-scenes Mandalorian masterminds. Sitting next to each other at the bar are pilots Sash Ketter, Jip Dodger, and Trapper Wolf, played respectively by Deborah Chow, Rick Famuyiwa, and Dave Filoni. All three have directed episodes of the series, but their impact on the Star Wars universe goes well beyond that. Famuyiwa was made an executive producer for season three of The Mandalorian, while Chow led the entire Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Filoni served as showrunner for both Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and Star Wars Rebels, and has been an executive producer on The Mandalorian from the start. All three have previously appeared as these characters in The Mandalorian, but this time Time, Filoni gets to wear his iconic cowboy hat, which is a nice touch. These franchise bigwigs aren't the only notable guests in the pirate either. Misty Rosas, who's played various roles on the show including the Frog Lady in Season 2, plays the bartender. Later in the episode, Lieutenant Reed, who Teva speaks with remotely at the very end of the episode, is played by Max Lloyd-Jones, who was a body double for Luke Skywalker earlier in the series. After getting a full episode look at the New Republic on Coruscant in Season 3's third episode, Captain Teva ventures there for a brief visit in Episode 5. He comes seeking aid for the pirate besieged Navarro, but he's met only with red tape and excuses. Some of this is intentional sabotage by the villainous Elia Kane, but some of it is simple bureaucratic incompetence. Teva accuses Colonel Tuttle of acting like an Imperial official, but this scene also evokes the Republic in its final days during the Clone Wars. Numerous arcs in the animated series revolve around neutral planets, asking for help and being ignored by both the Jedi and the Senate. The refusal to send help because Navarro isn't a member planet echoes these critical failings of the Old Republic. Mandalore, in particular, suffered from these kinds of practices during the Clone Wars. Duchess Satine Kree's bo sister refused to join the Republic's war effort so Mandalore was left alone to fend off attackers, including the Death Watch and Darth Maul's Shadow Collective. This neglect weakened Mandalore before the rise of the Empire. Viewers know that the New Republic is eventually devastated by the First Order, so these mistakes really stand out. During Din's dogfight with the pirate snub fighters, there are a couple of notable callback lines. When Din first swoops in and gets on the horn with Grief Karga, the High Magistrate tells him that he's outnumbered 10 to 1. I like those odds. This calls back to Din's meeting with Werner Herzog's client way back in Season 1, a scene that also takes place on Navarro. When one of the stormtroopers tells Din they have him 4 to 1, the Mandalorian says the same line. I like those odds. Later in the dogfight, the duplicitous pirate Vane announces to his comrades, I'm on the end one. The line is delivered in a curiously monotone way for Vane, as if it's meant to elicit memories of Darth Vader's famous, I'm on the leader. From A New Hope. The fact that an N1 starfighter was the first ship Anakin Skywalker ever flew only makes this line feel more intentional. 
After clearing Navarro of pirates and being welcomed as heroes, the Mandalorians decide to finally live out of the shadows. Bo-Katan and the Armorer meet at the Covert's old Navarro Sewers Forge, and the Armorer explains how this much smaller forge is the same as the old Great Forge of Mandalore, because they share the same purpose. This is a metaphor for Bo-Katan herself, who must now use her experience with the various Mandalorian groups to unite them. While they aren't directly referenced, this scene evokes Bo-Katan's arcs in both Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Bo-Katan has indeed walked in many different Mandalorian worlds, from the old regime of her father, her sister's pacifist government, the Death Watch, the Night Owls, the Imperial Occupation, and finally, the Way. With all this experience in so many Mandalorian cultures, she's the perfect person to bring all of Mandalorian Mandalore's scattered people together. The armorer asking her to remove her helmet seems like a big shift, and it is, but it also fits. She's clearly shaken by Bo-Katan's vision of the Mythosaur, and she now believes that their people are entering a new age. Perhaps helmets won't need to be worn at all times anymore, or at least there may be room for some diversity of thought. The sixth episode of the third season of The Mandalorian, called Guns for Hire, opens with a strange encounter on a Quarant ship. The vessel is hailed by an old Imperial cruiser operated by a mercenary group of Mandalorians, the same ship and team that Bo-Katan previously assembled. We learn from the group's new leader, Axe Wolves, that they've been sent to apprehend the son of a Mon Cala viceroy and return him to his family on Mon Calamari. Apparently, the young man ran away from home to be with his Quarant lover in a Romeo and Juliet-style love story. The long-standing political tension between the Quarren and Mon Cala is well documented in Star Wars canon. It's the primary subject of the Clone Wars arc, Water War, and it's been explored in various other stories as well. The reference to it in Guns for Hire doesn't seem to hold any greater significance, other than calling back to that established conflict while offering up a little heartbreak. In director Ridley Scott's sci-fi film Blade Runner, protagonist Rick Deckard is tasked with hunting down rogue replicants in a neon-tinted metropolis. There are questions about machine sentience, humanity, and what it means to be human. In Guns for Hire, Din and Bo-Katan go on a very similar mission. They hunt down rogue droids who have been diverting from their programming and harming organics. Along the way, their droid prejudices are called into question, and they discover the hidden droid culture on Plazir 15. The super battle droid chase scene through Plazir 15's neon-glazed streets at night feels particularly overt in its inspiration. The set is very similar to the ones used for the crowded markets and city streets in Blade Runner. Much of the droid population on Plazir 15 consists of old battle droids from the Confederacy of Independent Systems who fought the Republic during the Clone Wars. This makes a bit more sense after it's revealed that Commissioner Hellgate was and still is part of the Separatist cause. The Duchess says that he served her family for some time, so he may have begun using old Separatist technology many years ago. It's fun to see the droid designs in live action again, and especially to hear the base model battle droids funny voice one more time. As in The Clone Wars, the voice is provided by sound editor Matthew Wood. This is a restricted area. You are to vacate immediately. Equally interesting is hearing someone in the New Republic era mention Count Dooku by name. Hellgate clearly knew nothing of Dooku's Sith connections, remembering him merely as a political idealist who fought back against a corrupt Republic. Guns for Hire ends with an action-packed duel between Axe Woves and Bo-Katan Kreese. Bo challenges her former subordinate for the right to command his mercenary force, which was once hers, and she handily wins. The battle is bound to conjure memories of similar moments from the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, in which Mandalorian honor duels are common. Both combatants use a wide range of weapons and tools. At one point, Axe pulls out what appears to be a small vibroblade, a tool that several Mandalorians, including Din himself, has previously used. In the Star Wars Legends timeline, Vibroblades were even able to contend with lightsabers, though their power has been subdued in the Disney era. Moff Gideon's meeting with the so-called Shadow Council is a treasure trove of lore and Star Wars Easter eggs. The Council itself was first introduced to Star Wars canon in the Aftermath trilogy of novels. It was created in secret by Gallius Rax, a protege of Emperor Palpatine, tasked with ensuring the Empire's reconstruction in the Unknown Regions. It was theoretically dissolved after the Battle of Jakku and the official end of the war, but it clearly persists. Fans will recognize plenty of the members of the Council, such as Captain Gilad Pelion, who was a key character in author Timothy Zahn's Thrawn trilogy. Pelion is a high-ranking Imperial officer who was Thrawn's right-hand man after the Battle of Endor. 
Pelion previously made a canonical voice appearance in Star Wars Rebels as an aide to Thrawn, and it seems that he has kept that role in the Unknown Region since. Also present at the Shadow Council meeting is Brindle Hux, father of First Order General-turned-spy Armitage Hux. Brindle is played by Brian Gleason, the younger brother to Donald Gleason, who plays Armitage in all three Star Wars sequel films. Brindle served under Palpatine during the Imperial Era when he developed the idea of training stormtroopers from birth. Brindle was also responsible for finding Phasma and bringing her in as an eventual captain of the First Order military. His stories are detailed in many Star Wars books, including the Aftermath trilogy and the novel Phasma. In The Mandalorian, Hux is associated with a mysterious Imperial plan called Project Necromancer. Moff Gideon makes a comment during the Shadow Council meeting that Hux is interested in cloning, so this is likely a nod to Palpatine's eventual return. The Spies also features a fun nod to classic cinema. When Bo-Katan asks for volunteers for a recon mission to Mandalore, no one speaks up. But after Din, Koska Reeves, Paz Vizsla, and Axe Wolves finally volunteer, others begin to follow. A refrain of I will go rings out around the campfire, with one Mandalorian at a time rising to declare their loyalty and dedication to a shared cause. It seems pretty clearly meant as a reference to the famous I am Spartacus scene from director Stanley Kubrick's Spartacus. In the film, when the Romans demand Spartacus' defeated army turn their leader in, every soldier proudly declares himself to be Spartacus to protect the real one. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! The Mandalorians also have a warrior culture, and that they have a similar sense of honor, so this homage works well. When the Mandalorians finally arrive at the Great Forge of Mandalore, they're not alone. Moff Gideon has already erected a full Imperial base within the boundaries of the Old Forge, likely built years prior following the Great Purge. Gideon explains his plan to steal the natural resources of Mandalore to create an even stronger Dark Trooper model. He also claims to be a superior version of what the Mandalorians had once been. The base itself is full of classic Star Wars designs, from the TIE interceptors and bombers hanging from the rafters, to the blast doors from the original Death Star. The Beskar Stormtrooper armor, first shown earlier in the episode, is on full display too. There's also a brief glimpse of what will be revealed as Gideon's ongoing cloning experience. Experiments. As he walks into the meeting with the Shadows Council, he passes by a series of tanks with humanoid silhouettes inside. His later reference to the Jedi, cloners, and Mandalorians all having something of value, and it seems he's something of a cloner himself. In the season finale, we see that these tanks contain potentially Force-sensitive clones of Gideon himself. Moff Gideon has a new look in the third season of The Mandalorian. This newest version of his Darth Vader Halloween costume is the most complete one yet. The armor is made of Beskar, the cape is flowing in an incredibly stylish way, and most importantly, he now has a Sith cosplay helmet to go with the rest of the outfit. Gideon's desire to be seen as a Vader-esque figure has always been apparent, but here, it's more obvious than ever. He's also taking inspiration from the Mandalorians themselves, to whom he sees himself as a kind of conqueror. His helmet is most similar to the spiked one worn by Mandalorian Super Commando, Gar Saxon, at the end of the Clone Wars, when he served Darth Maul and adorned his armor with red and black paint. Gideon postures like a master villain in his homemade Vader look, but he comes off like a coward who's always hidden behind other people's strengths. That's exactly what he is, after all, and the Mandalorians see it clearly. He needs the Darksaber to complete his costume, and Bo-Katan is determined to make sure that he never gets it. Paz Vizsla goes down like an absolute champ at the end of the Spies, taking down the whole platoon of Beskar Stormtroopers and saving almost the entire recon team, before being taken out by members of the Praetorian Guard. It's a heroic death for a minor character who's gotten a lot of strong development in Season 3, and there's zero shame in losing to the foes who bring him down. In his earlier meeting with the Shadow Council, Moff Gideon requests three members of the elite Praetorian Guard, the same fearsome fighters who later protect Supreme leader Snoke of the First Order, and ultimately perish at the hands of Rey and Kylo Ren. The three who pop up on Mandalore have the same deadly weapons and striking red armor as they do in The Last Jedi. Paz may have had a shot against them at the beginning of the fight, but by the time they show up to take him out, he's nearly depleted. The Mandalorian Season 3 finale, The Return, is basically one giant, extended action sequence. And since it's set in a secret Imperial base, it's the perfect venue for some callbacks to the original Star Wars. Specifically, the battle in Gideon's headquarters pays homage to the Death Star scenes from A New Hope. 
Watching Din and Grogu sneak around corridors is bound to conjure images of old Ben Kenobi doing the same. All Imperial facilities look similar due to the requirements of fascist chic, but the specific pacing of the sequence is particularly evocative. The similarities only grow once Din confronts Gideon himself. Their battle plays out a bit differently than Darth Vader's last duel with Obi-Wan, but the illusion still plays. By the end, the episode also includes some nods to the second Death Star's destruction in Return of the Jedi. Axe Wolves crashes the Mandalorian's stolen Imperial cruiser into Gideon's base, mirroring the Executor being driven into the Death Star, too. After spending most of The Mandalorian Season 3 on the sidelines, R5-D4 comes in clutch during the season finale. Via comlink, Din tells him to scomp into the base to help out. Unless you've played Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, you may not know that the multi-purpose hacking tool used by R2-D2 and other astromech droids is called a scomp link. R5 uses his to infiltrate the base's mainframe, thus triggering yet another reference to A New Hope. Din calling out orders to R5 while navigating the base's defenses is sure to feel familiar. It's the exact same situation in which Luke Skywalker and R2 find themselves while saving Princess Leia from the Death Star. The moment when Din is trapped in the energy fields is particularly evocative, as it directly mirrors the iconic trash compactor scene. And just like R2, R5 comes through and helps our heroes succeed. The Beskar-clad stormtroopers, who guard Moff Gideon's base, aren't your average Imperial grunts. In addition to their shiny new armor, they're armed with a wider and more deadly range of weapons. While these Beskar troopers are new to Star Wars, in The Mandalorian Season 3, they seem to have taken some cues from the Purge troopers in Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Din's hallway fight to Gideon's command center is basically a video game mini-boss battle, with each energy field revealing slightly different foes. Some of the troopers wield riot shields and electro batons, which are used by many of the Purge troopers in Fallen Order. Din makes use of these tools himself to make short work of them, though things get a bit trickier when he confronts Gideon and the elite Praetorian Guard. In lieu of a lightsaber, Gideon also has a Purge Trooper weapon, a full Electro Staff. Prior to the rise of the Empire, Electro Staffs were also used by the Magna Guards who made up General Grievous's personal entourage. Grogu really shows off in The Mandalorian Season 3 finale. He holds off three Praetorian Guards by himself for an impressive amount of time in a scene that echoes the throne room battle in The Last Jedi. He plays a key role in their defeat, and he even has some non-Force-related highlights, like spraying Din with Bacta Spray from IG-12. That moment calls back to the Season 1 finale, in which IG-11 helps heal Din. And it isn't the only scene that does so. Grogu's big moment at the end of Season 3 isn't a force push or a clever attack, but an act of protection. As Axe Wolves crashes the Mandalorian cruiser into Gideon's base, Grogu uses all of his power to create a barrier around himself, Din, and Bo-Katan, shielding them from the flames. This is the exact same move he uses in the Season 1 finale to save Din, Grief Karga, and Cara Dune from a flame trooper. The difference, of course, is the scale. Din Djarin has acted as Grogu's father for most of The Mandalorian, but in the Season 3 finale, that relationship finally becomes official. Din asks the armorer to acknowledge Grogu as his apprentice and a foundling no longer. When she refuses on the grounds that he is too young to speak the creed and therefore requires parental permission, Din declares that he will adopt the little guy. The armorer then dubs him Din Grogu. What's arguably even more interesting here is the armorer's brief reference to Din's Mandalorian youth and apprenticeship. Just as your teacher did for you. So, who was Din's teacher? The way the scene is set and the particular delivery of the line implies it might have been the armorer herself. That would make sense given the close relationship the two share, and it would add an interesting extra layer to their dynamic. Of course, this could also be setting up something else in The Mandalorian Season 4. Perhaps Din's time as Grogu's teacher will lead to flashbacks to his own youth. After vanquishing Moff Gideon and his forces, the Mandalorians begin the long process of restoring their homeworld to its former glory. They begin with two of the planet's most sacred sites, the Living Waters, where Ragnar Vizsla finally speaks the Creed, and the Great Forge, which is lit for the first time in decades. There's also another view of the old capital city of Sundari, where Bo-Katan's sister Satine once ruled. It's little more than rubble, but with plant life returning and the Mandalorians ready to rebuild, it could be great and proud once again. 
This isn't just momentous for fans of The Mandalorian, but for Star Wars Rebels and the Clone Wars followers, too. Bo-Katan's story and the modern saga of Mandalore have been going since before Disney took over the franchise. At the Great Forge, Axe Wolves leads the other Mandalorians in an appropriate chant. In the past, the phrase has been used as a battle cry. It's even shouted by the villainous Death Watch in the Clone Wars. But here, it's more of a declaration of peace. The clans have reunited, and the planet has been reclaimed. Now, at last, the Mandalorians can build for the future.